Hey, 4 C Divers, welcome to Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in. As you know, I'm Nicole, I'm your social media gal for 4 C. How's everybody doing? Are you guys all diving? It's been gorgeous on the water. Flat calm seas, great viz, and we've had lots of Goliath groupers on the wrecks here. So if you haven't been out diving, it is time to get your gills wet. Let's go diving, give us a call. Let's check in, let's say hello. To our guest presenter, everybody wave and give a hello to Christina. Tell us where you're listening in from. We uh, want to know, are you here in Florida? Are you outside of the state of Florida? Are you outside of the country of the U.S.? Because Christina's right now sitting in the Bahamas. Don't you wish that you were sitting in the Bahamas? I do. <laughs> All right. So, guys, as you know, um, when I started as a social media person at 4C, the first month that I started theming was September, and I did Shark Month because I love sharks. I love everything about sharks, and I don't even have a favorite species because I just love them. And uh, I, I kind of go in waves. Like one year I'm a hammerhead fan, the next year I'm a tiger shark fan, next year I'm a, I mean, sometimes I'm a nurse shark fan. So, uh, But it is Shark Month, so what you guys are going to want to do is go to our website, go to www www.force-e.com and go on our website and check out the videos and the page that we have that has all the information about diving with sharks or how to be an ocean conservationist towards sharks and we have lots of cool things there and also products that we sell that have shark themes so shirts hats all that fun stuff also while you're on the website go to the event tab before 6:45. I'm gonna leave the online registration open. So go to the event tab and register your name and your email address. And I'm gonna do a live drawing at the end of this presentation. And we're gonna give away some shark swag. That's right, guys. We're gonna give a shark t-shirt and a shark hat. So if you guys want some gear with some cool sharks on them, you gotta register before 6.45. All right, so everyone's tuning in to say hello to you, Christina. It's so awesome to see everybody here. Awesome. Everybody, I want to know really quick before we start, if you can put what your favorite shark is in the comment section. Go ahead. You can even get points if you put it with an emoji. So like if you're going to say lemon shark, like the lemon with the shark, get it? All right. So let's see some creative shark emojis on our comment section. Awesome, guys. All right. So Guys, I don't know if you know the backstory. This is kind of a cool story. 12 years ago, I met the guest presenter that you're about to meet tonight at DEMA, which is the trade show for dive professionals and manufacturers. And I walked up to her and I said, I want to come work for you. <laughs> and she goes, great. And then I don't know, it was like the recession or something happened. And I ended up in Florida. And I stayed in Florida instead. And I've always, always wanted to have Christina come over and do a presentation about what she does, who she is, and what she stands for in the shark world with conservation. And now because of technology, because COVID happened and we all do Facebook Lives now, I've been able to get Christina on our online. So guys, I hope you're as excited as I am to listen in on what this famous lady does. Uh, with sharks. So Christina, go ahead, take it away. Hi, Nicole, and hi, everyone. Nicole, you forgot to mention what was the end of that story. Do you remember when I said great? Is because I look at your legs and I said, oh, yes, those are the legs of a girl that is actually on the boat all the time. You don't remember that? I do remember. I had just gotten back from working in Hawaii, and I had fallen off the boat when I was carrying tanks <laughs> and hit some lava rock, and I had scrapes and, and everything down my legs. And you were like, okay, you clearly know how to work. So you're coming. To work. <laughs> I do remember that. That was funny. <laughs> but it's so, funny how the, the, how the tides have turned because, you know, we've stayed friends this whole time and I'm, I'm so, so excited for your presentation tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you everyone for being here. So it was kind of uh, trying to figure it out what to present, what to talk about. So I decided to go with, um, uh, with a little presentation 
uh, called I Wish There Were Sharks in Caves, which is part of basically a little summary of what I do. Because sometimes people say, well, what do you do? What do you do? And it's kind of hard to explain this. So this is uh, a little bit where I come from. Um, I start always my story uh, by mentioning uh, one of my favorite uh, stories uh, from um, Iser, which basically is a starfish, a thrower. And it talks about a young kid that is walking on the beach and sees a stranded starfish and starts putting, putting them back into the water. An old man passes by and asks him, what are you doing? And when he says, well, I'm putting the starfish back into the water because of the extremely low tide, uh, the answer is that uh, there's thousands and thousands of starfish and miles and miles of beach. You will never make a difference. Uh, but the kid grabs the starfish and puts it in the water and says, I made a difference for that one. And that to me is the story that has inspired and pushed me uh, through my career. Uh, because sometimes, yes, we might not be able to make a difference for the thousands and thousands of starfish, but there's always the one we can make a, a, starfish, uh, a difference from. So we're very much close by. I'm based in a Freeport, Grand Bahama. So it's a little island hop uh, type of flight. And I've been here 27 years. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, when I started. Um, I came here on vacation to learn how to scuba dive. I fell in love with scuba diving and the fact that we had sharks in the water everywhere. And I decided to stay. I wanted to stay for about a year. So somewhere, somehow I lost the track of time and here I am, you know, 27 years later. Uh, one of the inspirations in my life was my dad. My dad, I grew up with these black and white pictures of him wearing his rebreather, going on these incredible adventures. He was a military diver and I thought one day I will be like him. So I had this idea of being an underwater scuba ranger who will go around the world having sharks for friends and telling divers what to do, what not to do to protect the reef. So pretty much kind of like reached my childhood dream. Um, the other person that was my inspiration and mentor, unfortunately both of them uh, passed away six weeks apart back in 2010 was Ben Rose. And Ben Rose was the person that started here in Freeport, the shark dive with whom I basically start following and, and I was so excited and I became his little protege and continued his legacy to, to this day. Um, if you really want to know what inspired me <laughs> to love sharks, it was actually this movie from 1978. And I, I am sure that is one of the cheesiest movie ever. But at the time, 78 or 79, I was seven or eight years old. And I remember watching this movie. And I, look, I know it looks horrific, but in the movie, there was actually a guy that has sharks for friends. And we use sharks to punish those people that would hurt sharks. So I was like, I will be that person. I will be that person that will have sharks for friends. So Google it up, the jaws of death, the sheer terror. It obviously is still, you know, sharking a little bit gory, but it was actually about uh, protecting sharks. This is my office. This is my office has been for 27 years. Like I said, I started open water scuba instructor. Um, fast forward, I am, I am a paddy course director, so instructor trainer, I'm a cave explorer, cave diver. I still do uh, shark, um, quite a lot of shark work and conservation. I'm a technical instructor, I'm a rebreather instructor, blah, 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 all those things. So, um, my life is my work, my work is my passion, my passion is my work. It kind of like all blends in into one in these uh, uh, estimated about four years of underwater time. So if you put together all the minutes I spent underwater, it kind of like sums it up to about four years of my life. So quite a lot of time. So this is what I still do uh, here in Freeport. I primarily work with Caribbean reef sharks, and this is specifically the dive site. It's called Shark Junction. It's in about 45 feet of water in the, the family of the Caribbean reef sharks that have been there. Uh, just at a glance, I can look at this picture and I can recognize about eight or nine of my girls just from this picture. So I've been working with them all these years. Caribbean reef sharks live between 15 and 18 years. And some of these girls I've known for 13. And by say I known, I have a track record. So uh, uh, pictures, I have videos, I have like measuring, so all sorts of uh, connection. 
and this is kind of like the view when I jump in. It's uh, similar if you have pets, you open the door and you come home and everybody's like, Mama, you're home. So I enter the water and all the Caribbean reef sharks can uh, swim a little bit towards me. Um, and pre-COVID, I would say I would spend about 10 hours a week in the water with them. It has reduced a little bit, especially last year we had tremendous lockdown we couldn't even go out but i still try to go out with them uh several hours per week um my work as it started um uh, it's basically uh, a shark diver uh, i use a uh, shark tourism to bring sharks to for people to see sharks so if you would say well what is your basic work is that so i started off on uh the shark dive and do that in front of people and bringing this group of Caribbean reef sharks are swimming over the divers, under the divers, and uh, being a diving professional. Um, this is pretty much what a diver that comes on the dive will be able to see. This is a picture taken from the position, the stationary position during the dive. So it will be all these Caribbean reef sharks are swimming around, and then they live on the reef um, anyway. So that's kind of like uh, what people see. Um, one of the uh, things that, oops, sorry, I didn't realize I still has music. Uh, this is instead my point of view. So as you can see, I wear a chain suit. It's a um, stainless steel suit made up by a Neptunic. And the reason why I wear it is a firm believer that I protect myself to protect the sharks. So in the way the Caribbean reef sharks behave, the way they swarm around me, the way we, uh, we work together, is a wearing a suit. It's like wearing a seat belt. So if you look at this video, they're coming in. It's not that they're biting or anything, but having the suit is will prevent um, accidents that then will put the sharks in a bad light and obviously cause issues for our uh, professional shark dive. The Bahamas are um, highly pro uh, shark diving so even just this island alone we have the caribbean shark dive we have tiger beach with the tigers the lemons the bull sharks we have bimini with the great hammerheads cat island with the oceanic by tip just to name a few so um i do believe that in order to do this correctly you need to do this as safe there's a three safety levels and are the safety for the divers obviously that are watching this and are coming here and are coming here also when we're not here so when the sharks in the water but maybe we're not there safety for the staff so the people that are working with the sharks that is done in a reasonable controllable and safe manner and absolutely safety for the sharks which goes into uh, from the container, how we move, how the, the boat and, uh, you know secures itself, are the propellers on or not propellers on. So also, are we making sure that nothing happens so that the sharks will never be blamed? And like I said, I actually go in the water and from this pictures alone, I can actually recognize some of my girls. I named them, <laughs> as you can see, uh, Hook, Shredder, Vulcan. They're not the most flattering names, their names associated with a physical characteristic. Um, so uh, Shredder has had their healing, but if you notice here, there's like little lines on their body which were caused by the movement of their propeller, so like a little Shredder. Uh, Vulcan has a very pointy fin, the right fin, uh, that reminds me of the Vulcan um, air jet of the uh, I think is Air Force in the UK, so it's very pointy like airplane, so I called her Vulcan. Her sister showed up at the same time and everybody thought I called Vulcan Vulcan because of Star Trek, so she ended up with the name Trek. Hook is named after the shape of her dorsal fin, which is like shaped at a, like a hook right at the bottom instead of being straight. Why these kind of names are not, you know, Christina and Nicole and Sophie, primarily they're all females. Uh, one of the reasons why is uh, uh, what I want people to do is uh, to have an immediate connection with a shark. So in this picture, for example, you have Peggy. Peggy from Peg, having a little peg on your hand, is missing a little part of her pectoral fin. If I said that Nicole 
is missing a little part of the pectoral fin and Christina has a blind eye and Stephanie has uh, the dorsal fin shaped like a hook. By the time I give 20 of these identification with 20 names, it would be much more com complex for someone that has maybe one or two dives time to figure it out. And wait, was it Christina that had the cutoff fin or was it Nicole with a blind eye? And they can remember. But if I say Peggy, Peg is the one that has a cutoff fin, it's very easy to recognize. If hook is the one with the dorsal fin shaped like a hook, the person can immediately make a connection. Because one of the problems that I notice with sharks, and I know I'm talking to divers, so most of you, I assume, are absolutely shark lovers. I saw all the list of all the sharks that you love. But in general, when people think about sharks, they have a, a general like presence, like, well, it's, you know, it's a gray body swimming through the ocean. If we go outside of the diving world, we actually enter something even more uh more unique where people, you know, thinking, oh, they're ne nerve ending machines, you know, they're vicious creatures. So I want people to connect. And the first thing that we connect with is through a name. So this is not just a gray body animal swimming through the water. This is Peggy. Peggy has a story. Peggy has a side. Peggy has her own folder and Peggy has a personality. This is, for example, Black Spot. He's one of my, the, the guys, uh, the males. He only shows up on the dive when he has problems. Once the problems has been solved, he's going to swim away and disappear. You will find them on other reef, but you'll not find them specifically on the dive. He only comes back when he has hooks and he needs me to remove them. Um, so he's called Black Spot because one of his eyes, instead of being cut shape, is looks like he's having a black patch. So it's an honor the, of the... Um, basically the pirate. And what do I do? I do a little bit, you know, some people say, well, it's just a little bit of a show, but it's um, a way of saying, I love sharks, right? I, if you uh, go anywhere on my interviews, on my social media or anything like that, you will never find me saying sharks love me. I cannot give sharks an anthropomorphic interpretation of their behavior. I know there are two things. They are not afraid in that moment. I know they are not in a, a painful situation in a moment because they decide to stay. But the action of interacting like this and giving a kiss or a pat on a shark is to say, I love sharks. So what happened some time ago is, um, and let's, let's face it, when I started this, it was all about me. And I'm pretty sure as a new divers, that's all we want. It's about my dives, what I can do, how can I be, what can I enjoy, what can I experience. But very quickly I realized that um, although I love sharks and I've been loving sharks for all this time, most people are absolutely terrified. There was very much a misunderstanding on these animals. And for the majority, when you say the word shark, people thought about you know four or five species, maybe not realizing there's 522 plus species out there. So, I made it my journey to decide to start helping people understand sharks. So, uh, for example, in this picture, which is not the you know, best picture ever, I'm helping a scientist collect DNA uh, from a shark that I can put to sleep and she can kind of like rest a, a little bit in my lap. Um, I will also do quite a lot of, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, we literally have sharks with laser beams. We basically measure sharks, and this is a, a wonderful gift from Dr. Miki Makomkomsa, and is a two little laser pointer with a little GoPro. You have to be able to take a video. Here comes a secret agent. Um, you have to be able to take a video and a screenshot like this, and then go home and through a chart, you can actually measure the sharks. So, so I have all the growth rate of all the girls that have been on the diet. Uh, the biggest ones so far are recorded at about eight feet, uh, 10 inches long. So grandma, stompy, croak recorded like at that length. Considering the Caribbean reef shark's biggest size has been ever recorded, 9.6 feet, um, 8.10 is a quite a, a quite a big animal. If you think about the average height of a human is not the one of Yao, who is a seven feet tall. So for 9.6 of Caribbean reef sharks is the longest Caribbean reef sharks. The average is eight, eight and a half. So eight, 10, uh, we sport <laughs> pretty good girls on that dive site. 
And then the other thing I started noticing is obviously uh, sharks. And by all means, I'm not against fishing. I'm not against people going out fishing. This is, please understand, this is my relationship with the sharks. And one of the things I started noticing is that sharks actually hurt when they uh, become hooked. And so you can look at the size of this hook. It's definitely not designed for the shark. Sharks will be sharks. You go fishing and you have a struggling fish at the end of your line, chances are a shark will come in and snatch it if you're in the correct area. But they end up with these hooks and they start having quite a lot of infection, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, painful ways, uh, you know, they kind of even don't eat. Do I watch them like diving into the sand and trying to get the hook removed? So a few years into my work with them, I decided to use my skill to try to remove the hooks. Um, not all hook removals are um, like easy. Not all hook removals actually look pretty because there's quite a lot of force. Because I am on scuba, it's not that basically I am uh, grabbing them, pulling them towards the boat. And if she doesn't want to stay, she is not going to be able to stay. But what I noticed that they were doing, and here I'm checking the damage after I removed the hook, is that although I removed this, it was a three inch hook with eight inch lure. Um, when I remove the hook, not only if the shark doesn't have the hook removed immediately, keeps scamming back and allows me to try over and over again, also new sharks that I never seen before come in and allow me to uh, remove hooks. Maybe this, I would say perhaps this is maybe one of the most famous hook removal. Um, this is foggy eye and I could see in the wire coming out of her mouth and I kept putting her to sleep and opening her jaw and basically uh, when I posted this video, I only posted the final phase. Uh, not thinking at the time that I should have said, it took me about 40 minutes of work to finally decide, okay, I'm gonna just, uh, shove my hand down her mouth and try to remove the hook. But the most spectacular thing about Foggy Eye, and Foggy Eye is gone. She's, she's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, she developed something that looked like a, a tumor growth and she kind of disappeared a couple of years ago. Uh, but what happened after I removed that is a Foggy Eye absolutely uh, changed her behavior. Um, this, is, this is her when she was nice and healthy. Um, before, she would never allow me to pet her. She'll come in, she would, I could reach out, touch her on the top of her head, but never, ever will lay in my lap. Never. She would never allow me. And I don't force my girls. So I only have a core of girls that want to come in and be pet. The rest, if they don't want to be pet, they don't get pet. Before guys are doing these things where she will see me and just come in and straight like bump into my back, into my thigh, into my arm. And this picture was taken because I was standing there and all of a sudden I felt this little bump on my side and I look and she was just leaning into me and just basically sitting there on the ocean floor. So I just nailed down and gave a little rub. And I think one of my favorite pictures of Foggy Eye and I. So it was like very much a changing in behavior. And that's maybe one of the things that I can tell people. You know, people are like, uh, do sharks have personality? And I said, absolutely. They have different personalities. They have different attitudes. Uh, some sharks learn fast. Some sharks learn slow. You know, like any other creatures, in, like any of us, right? Some of us are more introverts. Some of us are more extroverts. So sharks do have very much hierarchies and behaviors, but also relationships and interactions in different level at which they uh, communicate and work. So then I started removing these hooks. At first, I would just grab the hook and toss it in the bin. And, and then I had somebody said, oh, can I have one of the hooks? And I was like, sure. And then I basically uh, started, excuse me, uh, started to collect them. Um, right now, my box is overflowing. What I didn't, what I'm trying to do with the hook is the story of the star thrower. I can't help all the sharks in the world. Sometimes I receive messages, oh, there's a shark in Hawaii with a hook. And I'm like, I'm in the Bahamas, I will not go to Hawaii. And furthermore, uh, don't encourage people to go ahead and try to remove shark hooks from any random sharks you see. Just 
understand this is something that I attempted after many years with the same sharks, with the same work, and now that I have a technique is with the same species. So there's quite a lot of work. So I don't encourage anyone to go ahead and say, yeah, sure, I'm just going to go out and try to remove hooks. By all means, don't. What I'm trying to send out a message is this is a living, breathing creature who is actually hurting like any other animal. To me, remove a hook from my sharks is like removing a thorn out of my dog's paw. It has the same need in my heart and it has the same power for me. So that's the reason why I remove. And so what I try to do is I also teach a shark course where people can come down one-on-one -on -one with me and put the chain suit on and actually reach out and interact with the sharks and work with them at the level that I do. And I'm very... Uh, blessed to have had clients from literally all over the world. I have over, I actually keep track of the countries. I over have 60 countries and more from people that I taught this. And uh, quite a lot of them come from countries where I don't speak the language of. And it's the, they're going back as the new ambassadors. So they're going back, the lady in the center is from Kuwait. The gentleman on the side there is from Indonesia. They can go back and in their own language, in their own communication, in their own cultural capabilities, they can actually transfer a message further down the line. And so, yes, I do this as a profession, but quite a lot of that then goes back into then training, for example, locals do quite a lot of uh, advocate work and conservation work and research work so that people can understand more and appreciate more about sharks. So very much I love to bring people to do this, uh, this down. Um, during the dive, like in these pictures, uh, people have the opportunity to kneel down and actually interact directly um, with the animals and everything is one-on-one -on -one, so very much um, a personal one so these are all part of the people that i train and i also train professionals uh, so primarily i train um, bahamians or people that come to the bahamas and stay here on a professional level obviously they go through quite a more intense training and then they become part of the team uh, that works with me and helps out with the sharks, with the dive, with removing of the hooks. Um, quite a lot of my work is about education, local education very much. Uh, I'm a course director, so I train uh, Bahamians, uh, primarily a dive master and instructor, but then I speak at local schools, organize beach cleanups, we take kids swimming, I host the scholars. So quite a lot of that. Um, used to be more <laughs> lately thanks to covid this is more or less the part the education um, like nicole said technology has been incredible but basically between march 2020 and today i've done over 250 online um presentations uh, for free, like for people in classrooms, uh, young people, um, university clubs, dive clubs, uh, even just um, general like women's club or maritime academies about uh, quite a lot of subjects, as you can see, from caves to sharks or from facing your fear so that uh, we can share this knowledge and we can expand this and we can actually have more ambassadors out there. And hopefully one day I can go back to this. We all hope to be able to go back to this. So also travel to different conferences. Um, I've been invited many times, uh, both in Singapore and China. I very much believe in the power of being invited into a country and being facilitated through their culture and the language to be part of their um, goal. For example, this one from Singapore was I'm finished with Finn's campaign, and it was about... Um, using local people in Singapore, for example, uh, famous actors, actresses, singers, to say I'm finished with fins and everybody put something in front of their mouth that was related to their job. So a photographer will put a camera, so I put my chainmail glove. And we were like four of uh, with uh, David Dubillet and um, Wyland invited to be the guest uh, from outside to talk about this. Um, the star thrower also goes in my day to today's action. So no matter if I'm going cave diving, top pictures, take my pups to the beach, or shoot with BBC Blue Planet Live, 
I always try to do a little bit and clean the beach. Those guys in the background there, I know they look a little bit scruffy, but they're actually the producer and the videographer for Blue Planet Live BBC. And we were doing the interview on the beach and there was a little bit of garbage behind. And I said, when we were done, I convinced us that we're not leaving this little corner where you do the interview without cleaning it up. So off, I <laughs> kind of like had this famous producers and videographer help me out clean uh, the beach. And that is sharks. Uh, sharks are related to the beach that I clean, are related to anything else. But um, as if you remember, the title was, I wish there were sharks in caves. And uh, it is because both of them are two of my most founded passions. I love sharks and I love caves and people say, well, pick one. I'm like, I can't. But it was a few years into my career and specifically uh, during this dive, it took some time, right? So I love caves and I love sharks and I want to protect sharks and I want to protect caves. And then one day it was just like an absolute like, as sharks are related to caves and especially here in the Bahamas. This is a juvenile shark. It doesn't really appear from the picture, but you can see, you know, the, I was in ankle deep water and this is about a foot and a half shark. And I was preparing my gear out of the flat bottom boat, like what they use for bone fishing, to go dive into a cave where the mangroves was. And all of a sudden there was all these little baby sharks swimming around my ankles. And in a way, yes, I knew sharks are the mangroves and baby sharks are there. But it was the fact that I was not there to dive with sharks, I was there to cave dive. And all of a sudden I had all these baby sharks swimming around my ankles. And it was just very connected. Sharks like fish, like corals, use the mangroves as part of their nursery grounds. Well, these mangroves very much, especially here, are connected to the caves. In the Bahamas, we have two types of caves primarily. I'm pretty sure you heard about the ocean blue holes. This is an entrance of chimney. They are usually called like that because they look darker, stashed against the clear sand and the clear, crystal clear blue water of the Bahamas. These holes go underground, underwater underground, and they go somewhere. And what they do is they actually move with the tide. They move humongous amount of water. This is chimney during the siphoning cycle which you only snorkel around, you don't go diving in there because you would never be able to make your way out. And it siphons in this huge amount of water and as well as everything else that floats in the ocean, including pollutants visible, like there's a piece of plastic or invisible, like chemicals, boat discharges, cruise ships discharges or anything like that. And all of this goes somewhere underground into the water. This is another hole. This is cemetery hole. And uh, you can see that around the hole, there's a lot of fish life, right? So one of the things that Kevin Lorenzen and myself have set out to be in the last few years, especially, is to actually say, well, the Bahamians and everybody knows where the blue hole is. It was like they'll go there to spear fish. They'll know where the fish is. But where does it go? And when, where does it go also? Where does the water go? And what happens to it? So what we start doing is start laying line in all these places and with this little machine called Nemo, start mapping. We also went and basically start hiking through the islands and say, well, this appears like a cave, try to go in, but there's no cave entrance. And so we mark it. But we also create all of these um, map. Now the hall is off the beach, but the cave goes all the way to the sand. What does it mean? It means that if somebody were to come here and excavate or dig or create something, the pollution that goes from here will eventually affect the blue hole entrance because the water travels. We know that through the tidals, the water travels. And all the fish and all the healthy environment and all those mangroves and all those baby sharks and, and, and will be adversely affected by what has been done. Because we think, you know, out of sight, out of mind, it's kind of like, no, it's connected. It's basically an underwater river, all right? So this is maybe one of my biggest uh, accomplishments. We're very, very proud of it. It's basically a land cave with an ocean blue hole that I connected back in 2012 and is uh, situated underneath a native settlement. That means where people live and basically 
Um, this is a cave uh, in an unexplored, uninhabited area. So in a key where nobody lives on. So you go underground and this is, you can see the diver, but you can also see the level of clarity of water, right? This is a healthy cave. Um, in these caves, not only we have this transfer of water, we also have fresh water supply. So if you look in this picture, you may see that the top left corner is actually blurred. That is not because the photographer did a boo-boo, is because as I'm exhaling bubbles, my bubbles hit the halocline, the transition between two different density media. So in this case, the salt water and fresh water, and then mix them up. This uh, fresh water comes out of an island like you have in Florida. No mountains, no rivers, no glaciers, no snow, nothing, and fresh water out of the tap, like in cave country. So this fresh water is very much a golden resource for this country. In a healthy cave, you have a growth called microbial growth, which is this orange stuff, is a sediment, okay? Unfortunately, when you have an imbalance, like uh, if you want to compare it to the red tide that happened in, a, in the Gulf of Mexico around the North Florida, the Panendo, uh, is the same thing. When you have too much nutrients in the water, including human pollutants, this is the result. So this is the cave that I connected from the land to the ocean. It took me a few years just because every time I went in there, this is what the visible would turn up with. When the bacteria growth, instead of staying at the healthy minimum level or balance level, basically explodes into this uh, super overfed basic, uh, uh, animal. Right, and so reduces the visibility. Never mind, the water is completely polluted, has E. coli in it, and all of that. So, um, I love both, and I made that connections. And so, one of the things that we start doing quite a lot, we cooperate with the Bahama National Trust. Is um, I kind of <laughs> decided to basically make people fall in love with large, toothy animals that are perceived as large predators and wet rocks. Right? I mean, if I had to pick it really, really hard, it's like, I'm not going to make you fall in love with the octopus or the dolphins. I'm not going to make you fall in love with dark, flooded, rocky tunnels. And I'm going to make you fall in love with, you know, large carnivorous animals. So how do you do that is you bring up the images, you bring up the videos, you bring up the stories. And in this case, for the cave, what we start doing is we start bringing up your journey into the dive. So this is an interactive map, and this is an old video, so I haven't updated it yet, but we have like a brand new camera to do this. But you can see this giant yellow circle moving along the map. What it's doing is taking you on a journey, it's showing you, it's like, hey, how are you swimming along this line? This is where you are, and this is what you see. And so people can actually have like a tablet and then look on the cave on land and see like the map that you show. It's like, oh, wow, I'm starting from this ocean blue holes. And then they can actually follow their journey as they actually swim towards the beach in that case, or in this case, they swim along the line. So they actually have a direct experience of what it means to go cave diving and what you see and where you are. And now it's related with what's above it and what's around it and where is, are the mangroves and everything becomes very uh, much connected. So we've been doing quite a lot of this work. Um, some of the other stuff that we do is the um, three-dimensional. So not only where is the flat map and what does it do, but how much volume is down there? So this one, we basically lay kind of like a grid of lines. So I'm gonna just fast forward a little bit. Um, and once we have laid this grid, we're gonna use our little Nemo, I'm still laying grid here, and start doing measuring, and then put it in this system called Ariane's line that gives us the, the exact volume of, for example, that chamber. In this case, it was Ben's cave. I call it the blue hippo. Be basically, not only is this is where you are, this is what you see in a linear way, but this is how much space there is below your feet. And again, very much important from all sorts of stuff. Um, 
through this work with the Bahama National Park, basically I was able to support the promotion and approval of the expansion of the park so that the entire surface over the cave is actually protected. Again, because we cannot just protect the entrance, I need to be able to protect everywhere from the last piece of tunnel all the way to the entrance and even furthermore around that. So quite a lot of, um, very happy to be able to do that. Um, last but not least, I'm going to leave you with that uh, to help me with this work. I founded a little nonprofit called People of the Water, pownonprofit.org. Non it kind of like helps us all the tools and all the things that you see that we're using, um, provides for some of that um, capabilities of being able to do a little bit more. The presentation ends here. I would like to very much uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, if you don't have anything to look at, you can go either at pownonprofit.org. There's the entire list of all the exploration and education work that we've been conducting. And then if you're more interested on the diving part, come and visit and dive. You can go on christinazenato.com. Um, I obviously have so much more to say, so much more to share, but... Um, I think I used up most of my time. <laughs> no, it was great. No, everybody's really uh, focused in. They loved it. Um, so you talked about um, getting in touch with you because some people want to come and take that course with you. Is it best? You have a website you want to point them to or your personal information? Yes. Can I uh, write on it? No, I can't. You can. I think you can in the comments section on the right hand side and be live. Is this public or host chat? Okay, I'll be live. Okay, so, okay. Let's see if that comes up. You does everybody see it? No, um, I don't have access to to writing for whatever reason. But it's Christina Zenata .com. Christina without an H. So C R I S T I N A Z E N A T O. Dot com. And I also wrote during the presentation. You guys can always contact Four C. Info at force-e.com, and I can get you over to Christina, not a, not a problem. So, And we're hopefully going to look at doing some dives with her in the future. So keep your guys' eyes open for that when it comes onto the website. Um, so somebody wanted to know, besides the sharks that you, you know, work with every day, is there a favorite shark that you um, would say is your favorite? It depends. Um all right, from a beauty point of view, besides the Caribbean reef sharks, is the blue shark. Because when I went and awarded with the blue shark, I did not realize it possessed a little secret that you can rarely, rarely capture on camera, which is they'll have a little dab of gold right on the end of the tip of their nose, like right on the head. It looks like they're about to go out for, you know, out of the house. So oh, sorry, I'm gonna just dab a little bit of gold. So <laughs> that gold with that blue makes it, I think, one of the most beautiful sharks, uh, in my opinion. But then I'm fascinated, and like, I adore the cookie cutter and the story about the cookie cutter. Um, um, but like, if I had to pick one there, let's go with a blue shark. <laughs> nice. Um, and so, you know, you've got your non-for-profit, and I know that you work with some other ones. Is there some other ones that people can check out and see? because they might be doing some local stuff here in Florida. Yes, absolutely. Hannah Mid from American Shark Conservancy. She does extremely great research and shark work. Um, American Shark Conservancy and his or her nonprofit uh, right there in Florida, and you can volunteer. She does very much a cooperation, again, with fishermen. So she uses the fishermen to learn about the movement of the hammerhead. She's been doing some other great work. So yeah, if you right there would be one of my favorites awesome yeah because um hannah actually spoke last year for <laughs> facebook live and um if you guys go over to our website that um, support sharks page i was talking about i actually put it in the comment section while christine was talking um we'll share that again but uh basically you can see some information about hannah and what she's doing here locally for sharks so people want to know um you know the sharks that you're working with um do you find that because of what you're doing and everything, um, do you find that sharks in other areas, the same species, don't act the same is what they're asking? Like, 
do they have the same behaviors or are they kind of a different? No, of course, the, the sharks that are now used to, used to humans are, uh, will behave uh, the difference between an, a domestic dog and a wild dog. And I see that when I rescue dogs on the island. If you rescue a dog that has been in somebody's care before um, and is, they haven't been mistreated, they're like more approachable. If you try to rescue a dog that maybe has been living in the bush for quite some time, it's so a little bit more reluctant. So sharks in general, yes, there's a, a little bit of a difference in behavior. They're less prone to uh, come in uh, the way my sharks do. Well, and I think too, um, especially if they come around for quite some time, they might be a little skittish at first, then they relax and get used to it and they kind of feel it out and they get the sense of, okay, this is how it works here. If I'm going to hang out here, this is how it works here. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes with the shark diving, um, you know, things that people go on, you hear about these things called um, superstars or uh, supermodels and you get right. those sharks that are just in your face all the time. They're totally like, whatever, if you're there, great, take a picture of me. If not, I'm I'm gone, see ya. So, um, and there's the ones that'll hang back in the distance. Correct. They'll come in and, and you could come to that spot numerous amount of times and they still, they're still too skittish. So, you know, just like dogs have personalities, these sharks have personalities. And actually it's not just, you know, the sharks you're working with, it's even with, if you go over um, to do Tiger Beach, and the tiger sharks are that way, the lemon sharks are that way, you just, you have some of those supermodel type sharks and then you've got the ones that are like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm still, I'm cool, I don't like you people, I'm just gonna be over here, so. But the one thing I, I do, I can say, and you can probably back me on this one is, you know, when, when uh, you do have the bait in the water, it's not like you have sharks coming at you at every angle going, no, 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 like it's, it's more um, passive. It's very, they're just like coming in, sniffing, and what's going on over here? Let's check it out. And then they circle back around and then they come back in, sniff, sniff, sniff. So it's actually kind of like more like a dance underwater than it is. Like very much. I mean, <laughs> that video that you show there is my point of view. Like I'm reaching out and you don't see any of the sharks trying to bite or anything like that. So it's just like I said, this is a, a, a seat belt. And you know, the, the other thing you talked about, you know, you talked about your team of divers, you know, have a safety diver and stuff. You know, there's things to make sure that you can protect yourself and stay safe during your dives. Um, biggest thing is, is, you know, my hair, if I have it loose and let it flow, it looks like fleshy fish underwater. So guess what? My hair stays in a hood, you know, in back, you know, behind my head where it's not flowing around. Um, you know, I don't do sudden movements and flashing with my hands because, you know, that can be a, uh, something that sparks an interest. But, you know, wearing, you know, the, the wetsuit and full wetsuits and, and not wearing the flashy stuff actually is a much safer thing to do. So if you are looking to do shark diving um, either over with Christina or, you know, other places in the world, you do want to make sure that you talk to the operator about what they expect you guys to be wearing or doing during a dive, because I can't tell you enough guys. Um, we do not want to have these sharks look in a negative light. Like there should be no reason why someone's getting bit because we, the time when you see headlines that go, Oh, shark attack. It's like, you know, sometimes you just look at it and we're like, Oh man, that just set us back. Cause we've just been trying to so, you know, so many years of trying to get the sphere of jaws out of people's heads. And I, I think, uh, you know, having these inspirational talks by people like you, Christina, and showing that these things are not, you know, these horrible creatures and that you can live in the same ocean with them. So it's a great presentation. Everyone's been yeah. watching it. And uh, there's, Nicole, there's a very good question from Brad Amador. It just yeah. came up and I said, what do you say about those who say we shouldn't feed sharks because we'll turn them into beggars and we'll learn how to get their own food when they need to? That's a very good question because it's one of these, the people say, well, the sharks are, you know, end up like the bear, but the thing is the sharks are not bears. So the cognitive learning and associative capabilities of a shark is overpowered by their senses. To give you an example, if I am a baboon and you pull out a banana out of the bag, I will, as a baboon and my cognitive learning capability, associate your bag with a banana. So next time, I, baboon, can't smell it, can't see it, but I will snatch your bag trying to look for the banana, right? 
the shark will come in and actually have will go okay last time you had food but will come in and the eight senses that i have will clock in and go i can't smell it i can't feel it i can't see it i can't detect it i can they have ample lie of laurentina and it will immediately tell them no they have no food i've been down there in full chain with an empty tube and the sharks will come in and go like yeah right sure nah so they cannot become beggars and there's just something specifically about sharks that other creatures actually it makes them dependent mm -hmm. they still respond to their instinct yeah. so they can and here's an example i got hit by dorian i was out of the water for two three months while we were trying to get the island back on its feet we went back the sharks were fine they were not more aggressive they were not more intense they were not starving yeah then COVID hit and that was even harder and we were out of the water even more so no their cognitive learning is overpowered by their sensory system but that's an excellent question awesome okay so flipping out over to the case i have a question a lot of people want to know do you have plans to do more mapping of caves and i'm going to combine that also do you employ anonymous mapping devices hopefully that makes autonomous sense. uh so um yes definitely more uh, plans to make more maps right now we're waiting for the approval but there's a new law that came out from the department of environmental of protection and planning to have scientific permit um, and I'm just going through with the process we, uh, last year 2020 Kevin and I actually discovered two brand new caves on this island and laid over uh, nearly 14 miles of tunnels so we have quite a lot of work to do um, the autonomous what the system I use it's called NEMO uh, so N-M-E-N-O is created by one gentleman Sebastian Kister uh, from France so he lives in Mexico and is um, together with a system called Ariane's line I used to map with the old system compass and all of that the NEMO just makes it uh, way more efficient and more accurate so that's the two system that I use in and allows us when I met Ben Stay, Ben Stay was 33,000 feet long. It took me nearly two years. When Kevin and I did it together with the Nemo, it took us three months. Wow. And then we were two, not one. But yeah, and we were also on rebreathers. So, so it's definitely different than going on open circuit. But definitely it has great advantages. Yeah, yeah there's quite a lot of more plants and more caves to be mapped. And so, so if someone wants to become cave certified and everything, you do those certifications as well Correct. in the Bahamas. So if, again, if you want to do the shark classes or if you want to do some cave classes, make sure you contact either us or Christina and we can get you into that type of diving. So awesome. So I'm going to go ahead, guys. I'm going to pull in. This is our website and this is the page that I was talking about, Support Sharks. And it has everything in here that you guys can take a look at. We've got the Florida Shark Survey with um, Hannah there, Shark Ecology Course, Dive with Sharks, What's It Like to Dive with Sharks in South Florida, and obviously our shark swag. So you can shop online, and right now if you spend over 50 bucks online, you get this cool keychain. So we're excited to be Shark Month this month. Also, if you guys haven't checked it out, go to the event tab. I'm going to go there right now. And we've got all of our sharky stuff planned. We've got all of our presentations. We have a paint night next Friday, September 17th. And this weekend, if you want to get out and go diving, we have our shark tooth dives um, over in Venice Beach. So we have a few spots left for that one. Of course, the image isn't working. But if you guys want more information, go to that event tab right there, and we will figure it out. And like I said, we've got some shark swag to give away, guys. So I grabbed everyone's name from the Eventbrite. And really quick, we're going to give away a 4C t-shirt that has sharks on it and a 4C hat that has sharks on it. So first winner is da -da 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 -da. the winner is Brian, Brian Bodies. You're going to come on into the 4C and grab your shark t-shirt yay i'll be emailing you guys to remind you guys and uh if you don't live here i know brian does but if you don't live here and you're the winner we'll get it mailed to you all right so let's give away a hat here we go da -da 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 -da. 
And the winner is Michael. Michael Jameson, you are our winner of the Shark Hat. So guys, thank you all for listening. We always appreciate it. And that's why we always do these raffles because we want to thank you for tuning in. And obviously, thank you so much to our guest presenter tonight, Christina. Another awesome presentation. I know you do a lot of these, but we appreciate you and everything that you're doing to keep us informed about sharks and now caves. Maybe we can do a cave thing. And um, obviously, we want to get more involved in your organization. So again, um, can you tell them what the organization is called and, and what's the uh, website address? It's uh, www.pownonprofit.org. And then mine is Christina Zanato without an H. Great. Guys, if you ever want to see some cool footage, go to YouTube, Google Christina. She's got some great videos out there and some great documentaries about what she does. So thank you again. And everybody, stay safe and have a great weekend. See ya.